to the organisers for, for putting together such a nice programme and for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I'd also like to call attention to what was just written on the, on the board, the, the booking of taxis so that we can unfortunately leave this place and get back to ordinary life, but these mundane things must happen. Um, so yes, I'd like to talk about some uh, results on the brittleness and robustness of Bayesian inference procedures, which I think are more and more relevant to this community uh, as uncertainty quantification for the problems you've traditionally kind of considered comes more and more to the fore. Uh, this is joint work with Human Awadi and Clint Scovell at Caltech. Um, and I think all the slides for the, for the conference are going to be made available online, but uh, I also offer you a, a direct link from, from my webpage. And so at this point, I'd like to uh, immediately disturb your morning by asking a question. Who would like to see these as slides and who would like to see them on the board? Because I can do either. Obviously, I can do more as slides. Or we can have a nice human-paced first hour to the day on the board. This is inspired by a pedagogical discussion we had at dinner last night. So all those in favor of slides? All those in favor of the board? Excellent. We'll do it on the board then. I'll leave these up for uh, just a couple more minutes in case people want to do grab the slides uh, off the link and then I'll turn off the screen. So, uh, first of all, I've got to lay some of the setting of what, what do I mean by um, brittleness or robustness of, of Bayesian inference and I guess in this community it's probably even a good idea just to start off with, with an idea about what a Bayes procedure does. Actually, this is going to get annoying, so let's start here. So Bayesian procedures they're, they're essentially a game in conditional probability that they give uh, posterior estimates for quantities of interest using basically three ingredients. Uh, three ingredients. So one of them is uh, a prior. Uh, the second is a, a likelihood function. And the third one is some data. And I'll give spaces to all of these in just a moment. By the way, these are really excellent boards. If anyone else wants to do a blackboard talk, you really should. This is beautiful. Um, OK, so this is uh, a prior. This is really a probability measure uh, on what I'll think of as a, a parameter space. But especially in modern applications, you should think of this parameter space, uh, bold U, not as being some finite set or a chunk of uh, Euclidean space RD, but increasingly, at least from an analysis point of view, this could be a function space. Uh, mo modern applications of the, of the kind um, in, in which Warwick, for example, is quite, kind of quite active, Andrew Stewart's group, U is a function space. So already you have the, the issues of probability on function spaces. Uh, this data, this comes in some, in some space, bold Y. And however you choose to dress it up, a likelihood function, um, let's call it L, is really something that picks up uh, a parameter value, something that could be, quote unquote, the truth, and spits out a probability distribution for data if that parameter value were the truth. So you think of this as L of uh, blank U 
is the distribution of the data if u were somehow the right value of u. And it's uh, given, given the numerical analysis strengths of this community, probably uh, if I write down Bayes' rule, then you immediately see why there are questions of uh, robustness and stability to, to worry about. So your posterior is something in the form that the, I will abuse notation, whatever probability distribution notation you have in, in mind, that the probability of some parameter value after you've seen the data is proportional to the product of these two. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm using y for data. u given y is proportional to the product of the, the likelihood term and your prior. And this has to be interpreted in an appropriate sense, especially if you are in a function space setting. Obviously, on a finite set, this is, you know, these are just, uh, you know, finite sums to be done. The, pro uh, the constant uh, of normalization that does the proportionality is just to make sure that this guy is also a probability measure on the left. But there are natural questions to ask about Bayes' rule here. So in spite of its promise to, uh, to give me a, a rational way of updating whatever prior beliefs I might have about which u's are relatively more or less likely or more or less true into posterior beliefs, um, there, there are natural questions to, to ask. So So one might be the frequentist's question. So a lot of people in their intuitive understanding of probability have, I think, a, quite a frequentist mental model, namely that they think that the data uh, are really coming from some, some truth um, and that probability really means a long-run average of you know, ha what proportion of, of samples actually have uh, a given property lie in some measurable set. And so a frequentist might ask that, you know, if the data y are really distributed according to some measure mu dagger, and dagger is somehow conventional here just to denote truth. So if the, if the y's are really being de distributed according to, to some true distribution, and we observe uh, y1, y2, uh, and so on, all of these distributed according to the, the truth, does the posterior um, should we say capture uh, mu dagger as n goes to infinity. So that's quite a, a natural question. If there is really a distribution that is generating the data, you would love it if your Bayesian procedure, as you see more and more uh, data drawn faithfully from this data generating distribution mu dagger, if this posterior distribution would actually collapse onto the truth. Okay? If, there, if there is some parameter you're trying to learn, you would hope that with enough data you learn it. At this point, how do I kill the uh, the projector? Is there a, a simple button for turn for making that blank? Uh, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. So thank you, thank you. So a second set of questions, though, is. You don't have to subscribe to a particular interpretation of probability, and this is the one that this community, I would hope, would find natural, which would be the numerical analysis questions. Which is, how do these posterior predictions that you are 
giving to your client or your government agency or whatever, how do they depend, how stable are they on the ingredients of Bayes' rule? How does it depend upon the prior, the likelihood, the data? Because you know, the, the first thing that we learn as numerical analysts is no matter what problem you wrote down in chalk on a blackboard, the problem that your computer actually solved is a different one. Right. Your, your, your prior that you wrote down on paper is whatever, it then got discretized, it got mangled by the computer. Is that mangling going to leave you with a posterior that is radically different from the uh, one that the, the exact pen and paper calculation would have left you with? Or uh, is, is it a minor perturbation? And um, so when I talk about brittleness, Uh, I'm basically defining this word to be the strongest possible negative answer to both questions. So in other words, everything that I want to tell you in the remaining 45 minutes is somehow a compressed version of describing a situation in which both these questions have really profoundly negative answers, that apparently small changes to the prior and the likelihood, which together I would call the Bayesian model, lead you to basically the worst possible changes in predictions for posterior values. So if you wanted, I, I could call this uh, extreme discontinuity with respect to prior and likelihood. Okay. So for those of you who are comparing to, to the slides, um, at this point I'm skipping what is section one in the slides and I'm going to go straight to, to section two. I and mean, that's a, a necessary consequence of going through things on the board. OK, so I've already built up some of the, the notation that you're, you have uh, to recap. You have this uh, parameter space U, and it's equipped with this prior, uh, which I think I'll now call pi. Okay. And to, to recap, the, the fundamental part about uh, Bayesian uh, statistics or Bayesian probability is not actually Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule is simply a theorem about any old probability measure, regardless of how you're interpreting it. The fundamental thing about Bayesian probability in, in its applications is you're actually saying, I can summarize my beliefs about this unknown uh, little u in big U in the form of a probability measure. That is really the, the, the main thing, that I, I can actually say, I can really represent my uncertainty and my beliefs that way, rather than, say, through interval bounds but with no associated probability or consistency requirements in terms of sigma additivity. That's being a Bayesian. Okay, so this summarizes your knowledge or belief about uh, little u in the form of a probability distribution. And for those of you who are trying immediately to connect this, perhaps, say, to um, 
let's think you know the, the sort of the standard elliptic problem you would elliptic pde problem you would set up for modeling say subsurface flow for example you might be um the let's say the permeability structure of the rock which you're trying to determine maybe from some pressure measurements some measurements of the head one of the important things that the prior is going to tell you is somehow your belief about the regularity and the smoothness of the field u that, that's uh, already a good mental model to have and we also have this likelihood model which is really a function from u into probability measures on data space y. And that is really the thing that is describing for you two things in one go. Uh, it's describing the sort of the forward model, the relationship between u and idealized data, but it also includes a model for any observational noise or errors. So that's... In, in rough terms, that's physics, forward physics, plus uh, a, a noise or error. Model. And together, these two things are, de are defining a joint measure. So if I draw the parameter space U downstairs here, with some measure on it, and data takes values in Y. What I really have on each uh, slice, each fiber through U, is I've got a different distribution on Y. And so this is together going to define some complicated joint distribution. So the Bayesian model mu is the, is the joint distribution on u cross y. And let me make sure that I get the formula correct. So mu of a measurable set E is going to be the expectation with U distributed according to pi and then Y distributed according to L of blank U of the indicator function of U Y in E. This is in general not a product measure, right? In fact, it will be a product measure if and only if the, the likelihood actually doesn't care which parameter value you, you have picked. Okay. And then what is Bayes' rule in terms of this picture? We are in the business of starting off with a prior probability measure, pi downstairs. Then we observe some data, little y, and we are in the business of slicing this joint measure here, this, you know, at this point in, in general, you will need some machinery like a, di and a disintegration theorem or theory of regular conditional probabilities or whatever. And then that is producing for you, when you slice it along here and look at what probability measure has been induced on this horizontal fiber, this horizontal dashed line, it's maybe something like that. And so that really... If I can squeeze it in, is the is the posterior conditioned upon little y. Okay, so it's going to be a problem bringing that back down. Okay. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> well, it's not a problem for the moment. <laughs> To a, to a young measure. Uh, 
I'm not, I'm not familiar with the terminology there. Um, the one na name I have you heard used generally to describe this kind of construction of putting a family of measures together sort of vertically with a, another one downstairs is to call it a palm distribution. But I don't, I, I, I don't know of the name of young being used here. I, I, and I think that palm is also not someone's name. I think this is, the, the picture is you know, like a palm leaf. You have a distribution on the, whatever you call the spine of the palm. And then, of course, you have these transverse leaves. So that, that's the name I have heard used. Okay. Uh, so the traditional setting for problems like this is, you know, u is, for example, 0, 1 with Lebesgue measure or even a finite set. But modern applications are, are uh, really that u could be a, a function space of some kind. And then, of course, interpreting Bayes' rule and doing the conditioning is already a, a mathematically interesting task, coming up with decent measures on function spaces. So I should now tell you... Uh, a few things about what's called uh, specification, well specification or misspecification. So specification is a concept that we don't even need the prior for. Th this is purely about the likelihood model. So if um, the data y are distributed according to some mu dagger, which is a probability measure on y. And so this is really, uh, in some sense, this is a frequentist statement. I, I don't expect uh, anyone in this room to really care about these holy wars that there have been now for a century between frequentist and Bayesian statisticians. I, except for me, uh, I, would, I would like you to appreciate that to a Bayesian, it does not make sense to say that the data are distributed in a certain way. The data just come in, they are. You have a model for how the data would be distributed, but the data aren't generated according to a distribution. A frequentist, on the other hand, is, is really thinking that the, um, you know, the, the, the dice in the casino or Las Vegas or the roulette wheel is, is really a, pr a random process that is sampleable and, and replicable. And, and so it, it, you, you have to be at least a frequentist to say that the data really are being generated according to some quote-unquote true distribution, whereas Bayesians de deny the existence of this objective truth, or strict Bayesians do, at least. Again, there are lots of variations. But if the data are being generated according to mu dagger, then the model is well specified if there exists a, a u dagger in u such that the probability distribution on data induced by this parameter u dagger is in fact the data generating distribution. Okay? And in general there is no reason for your model to be well specified, so for example, I might only be considering Gaussian models L, and if the data is not coming from a Gaussian, then bad luck, my, my model is, well, is not well specified. And, and in fact, uh, the, the word for that is misspecified, so. So that's one concept. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And so, in some sense, the competition in, in statistics is between having. Um, a, a model class that is sufficiently broad to capture many mu daggers, and obviously I could just take, or I could consider basically every every possible probability measure on, on on y, and then I'm certainly well specified. But this is almost certainly unwieldy, and so I, and th that's an excellent point to to have brought up actually, because um, th this naturally leads to, you know, all models. other than 
um, you know, the entirety of that are wrong. But are some of them useful? Which was, a, a, you know, George Box's famous dictum: "All models are wrong, but some models are useful." Or how how wrong to the, does does a model have to be to be no longer useful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So. Um, yeah. Set of all L of blank U's given U in U is that. Okay. So, a natural question how, how, how wrong do we have to be before things become no longer useful? So, in addition to this, there's uh, something that I alluded to on the, on the second board on the left, which is consistency. which is somehow the one that you would really hope for in practice, namely, do I get the right answer if uh, I see lots of data? So suppose the model is the model is um, well specified, then the, uh, the procedure is consistent. And again, this is a, a hybrid ba uh, Bayesian frequentist concept. It's consistent if when I take the um, prior and then I condition it on some number of y's. So these guys are distributed independently and identically according to mu true. This should converge as n goes to infinity in some sense to a point mass on the true parameter value. So consistency is the term of art for in the asymptotic limit, all the, prob all the posterior probability mass lands on the true parameter value that by specification corresponds to mu dagger. Just take some water. I won't write it down, but there is also the question of what's called identifiability. Do two different U's lead to the same L of blank U, in which case you probably wouldn't be able to distinguish two U's that both corresponded to mu dagger, but I don't want to say that. That's, that's an, uh, something that's easier to say than to write down. So. Then the natural question is, under what situations does one have consistency? Because if you don't have consistency, then your Bayesian procedure could either be failing to converge or could be converging to the wrong answer, the second one being even more dangerous. More and more data comes in, and you become more and more convinced that uh, U dagger, U true is something, and that, you, that something you might be being convinced of is, say, the guilt or innocence of a human in court or you know, implications for a major bit of environmental policy or something. And you're getting more convinced because, hey, it's converging. Okay, so when do we have consistency? And, uh, oops. Keep that down there. So the classic result on, in this area is the Bernstein von Mises theorem. Which, of course, is due to the cap, which is why we name it after Bernstein and von Mises. Um, no, I, actually, in, in in terms of history, uh, Bayes himself never considered issues like this. Laplace, when he essentially reinvented Bayesian probability, did consider this, but didn't have the analytical tools to be able to prove anything about it. 
Uh, Bernstein and von Mises definitely made statements in this direction, but the first cast iron proof is, is uh, Lucien Lecamps. Um, and so, in rough terms, what this says is that if uh, you are in a finite dimensional situation, and um, your pi and L are let's just say, nice, because I need to do some differentiation here and there and do an expectation here and there, then the Bayes procedure is consistent, or let me just say then consistency holds, with one important caveat. provided that the parameter value you're trying to learn is actually in the support, of, not of mu dagger, sorry, that doesn't make sense, of the prior. In other words, if the true parameter value is here and the data are really being generated according to L of where I'm standing now, but my prior is localized over here, then no amount of data can possibly convince me to start going over there, which you can sort of believe even from Bayes' rule because I'm saying that the posterior is really a reweighted version of the prior. So the, you know, the support of the posterior is definitely going to be within the support of the prior. I can't be convinced of things that I have ruled out a priori. Um, in fact, you even have asymptotic normality. which is why this result is also known as the uh, Bayesian central limit theorem. Okay. Um, the, 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 the mean, uh, it's, it's worth saying that the mean is the maximum likelihood estimator and the um, covariance is the Fisher information. Divided by the number of samples. So your maximum likelihood estimator is drifting over to the true parameter value and you've got this approximate Gaussian distribution that's shrinking down around that. And the notion of convergence is actually total variation. So norm of um, pi given y1 through n minus n of u mle i f over n in tv. Um, I think there's also a convergence in probability around the outside. Yes. So uh, this goes to zero in probability mu dagger as n goes to infinity. So in rough terms, that, that's the Bernstein von Mises theorem. The Bernstein von Mises theorem says that in a finite dimensional situation, provided you were sufficiently open-minded to do sensible things like having a strictly positive definite prior that puts mass everywhere in the parameter space, you can't go wrong. You learn, you, you observe enough data, enough samples, you will figure out what that true parameter value is and the rate is basically a one over square root of n type rate, which makes Monte Carlo people feel very reassured. Right. So I wouldn't be do saying what's nice if I weren't also about to say what is nasty. So, unfortunately, it's uh, this does not hold in the infinite dimensional context.
or what statisticians would call the non-parametric context. So I think statisticians tend to think of parameters as being intrinsically finite dimensional, whereas for mathematicians, of course, a I just give the name parameter space to whatever space I happen to be thinking about. But to, to statisticians, the moment u is not a finite dimensional bit of RD or something, then they consider it to be not quite a parameter anymore. Um, and so the, the classic discovery in this area was by David Friedman, who died only a few years ago in, in 63 where what he did was he had um, your da the data were being generated by a geometric distribution with parameter a quarter. Um, so that's a probability distribution on the naturals, in including zero. Um, and it's this parameter here that he's trying to to learn there. So that really is the, is the U dagger in there. And he puts down a prior um, pi with support uh, the entire interval 0, 1. And lo and behold, uh, pi conditioned on lots of uh, observations goes and converges to a point mass on three quarters. Gives an explicit construction of, of a failure of consistency in the situation where your parameter space is, you know. So that the problem here now is that there are just too many probability measures that you could be trying to learn. Okay. So once the sample space has infinitely many outcomes, like li life is kind of really going wrong. Um, this gets uh, improved by Diaconis. Uh, Diaconis and Friedman. There's more stuff. What, what are there? 65? 65. 98. Uh, there's more recent stuff. Johnstone, Yahoo, and that's in the last five years or so. But also, it's not entirely hopeless. Uh, and this is why this becomes an interesting question, because you can have posterior consistency in the infinite dimensional setting. So there are some negative results, but on the positive side, we have things like um, let's see, uh, uh, so a, lo a lot of statisticians their mind would run to, to Ken Barron in, in '99. Uh, some stuff that I really like is uh, by. Uh, Richard Nickel and friends, and this is uh, just in the last year or so. So, uh, to describe it in words, uh, Richard Nickel, Ishmael Castillo, and so on, they're, they're doing the Bayesian game essentially in a Gaussian sequence space. They're playing it in little L2. And they ask the, these kinds of questions in the following way Can a set simultaneously uh, get lots of posterior mass, so it's what the Bayesians would call a credible set, and have lots of frequentist mass, it is a confidence set. So when a Bayesian says, I'm now 99% sure that the truth lies in here, are they also making a statement that's valid from a frequentist point of view that 99% of the data samples will land in that box as well? Um, and it turns out that if you ask this question about a ball in little l2, the answer is going to be no. But if you reweight things, squish this ball into an ellipsoid in just the right way, the answer can be yes. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, 
There's also stuff by Harry Van Zanten, also last couple of years and friends. And the only moral is this, that um, topology, topological and geometrical uh, details determine everything. You tweak your geometry a little bit, or you che tweak the kind of convergence that you uh, expect or are looking for, and the answers change from positive to negative, which from an application standpoint um, simply means that claims of consistency should be interrogated in the sense of, okay, but, but what, what metric were you using? You know, it, it's a bit like if someone gave you a convergence proof for some numerical method that used an absurdly weak topology. And, and he said, well, I, I believe this, but it's not really actually useful for me predicting the, any actual measurable outcome of, of this process simply because the topology is too weak. What, what I wanted was something that actually gave me convergence of the mean or perhaps even convergence of the process to, to borrow some terms from Tuesday morning's talk. Okay. So it, it's not that the uh, situations are hopeless. It's simply you really have to pay attention to the details. So that's sort of your, your hope for that somehow maybe this can all be uh, repaired. Right, let's see if this works. Ooh. It's also interesting to, to think what, what happens um, in the situation. It's interesting to think what happens in the situation that the model is misspecified. So as I wrote it on the board that's just been covered up, consistency when the model is misspecified uh, doesn't make sense. It's the kind of thing you would mark an undergraduate down for, for writing. The procedure is consistent when it's not even well specified because there's no true parameter value to converge to. And you give them zero. Right? But you can sort of say, OK, there's sort of a, a notion of consistency. Uh, when you're misspecified, so that no uh, u dagger such that L of u dagger is mu dagger exists, in that you can hope that. Uh, your posterior converges to, let's say, a point mass on some u hat, and that uh, L of u hat and mu dagger share some properties. Um, and let's say not too different. E.g., same, same mean, same variance. Or same um, expected value of a quantity of interest Q. So I would ask that the expected value under my posterior of whatever my quantity of interest is, at, at, at least this one I should, should get right, or, or perhaps with some systematic bias that, that I can correct for. And that's not an unreasonable desire, and again, there are positive uh, results in that direction too, but now I have to tell you about some negative ones. So the punchline to all of this discussion is that in big spaces, you can't be just a little bit wrong. Or the notion of a only a little bit wrong and hence still useful 
is one that's, you know, you're going to need very strong topologies to do it. So here, here is the, the bad news of, of Of, uh, of this result. So what's going to happen now if we've got uh, the setup as before? And for a moment, I'm going to think of these as sort of starting off in some initial state. Uh, I'll call the prior pi naught and and the likelihood model L naught, and these are giving me. Uh, a model mu naught. And I consider now some, uh, let's call them pi alpha, L alpha, giving me a Bayesian model mu alpha. And this is going to be close to mu naught in the following ways. and in fact, in any of. So I'm going to give three theorems in, in, in one go. So what would happen if um, the uh, total variation distance between your two mod, your two, effectively their random measures, is smaller than alpha, so for uh, zero less than Alpha much less than one. So I, you, I, I ever so slightly perturb the Bayesian model in the total variation distance. My computer does that just because that's what discretization does. Or, uh, well, I shouldn't write norms here. It's not a norm. It's just a metric. Um, the distance um, in the Prokhorov metric on probability measures is also small. There's always a nice picture to draw on with what the Prokhorov metric means, at least in 1D. There's a cumulative distribution function for, for one measure. Here's another cumulative distribution function. The Prokhorov metric, or distance between the two, is the side length of the largest square that fits between those two graphs. And it metrizes the topology of weak convergence sort of measures. OK, there's two metric notions of convergence. Another one might be that I simply demand that um, under the original setup and under the perturbed setup, that some test functions are close together. So here I have phi 1 up to phi. I'll use alpha again. Um, these are fixed test functions. And alpha, you should think here as being a natural number much bigger than 1. Okay. So three notions of closeness. Three notions of, I've only changed my model a little bit. What is going to happen to the posterior conclusions? I've either changed the model a little bit in total variation. I've changed it a little bit uh, in um, terms of uh, the Prokhorov distance. Or I've got some huge number of testable statistics in common between the two models. They might be exactly the same. Epsilon i could be, could be zero, or maybe they're just changing by a little bit. So those are the, the, the notions of closeness that we consider. And unfortunately, it turns out that none of these three notions, which are the eminently testable ones with finite amounts of data, are enough to give you um, any confidence in your posterior predictions. And so the theorem goes something like this, that um, so the key technical condition is that you suppose the data k 
can be arbitrarily unlikely in the sense that, okay, um, one little thing. My data will be observed to precision delta positive. So my, my ruler, if I'm measuring something, has gradations of, of, of mesh delta on it. Okay. And what I say is suppose that if you take a, a soup over all values the data might take and a soup over um, u's in u, and this is going to be the probability given u that you end up in a nicely fat open ball of radius delta about some observed data. That looks like a nice number. But now I do one more thing. I put on the outside a limit as delta goes to zero and ask that this be zero. So is it going to be the case that in the limit as my observations get as accurate as I like, as my ruler or microscope gets as good as I like, am I in the situation where mass can actually accumulate somewhere? And the answer is, well, most models don't do that because you know, even a Gaussian doesn't satisfy this. You know, yes, the Gaussian has a peak of, of height, one over square root of two pi, blah, 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 but in small intervals, it's putting basically zero mass especially once those intervals go to del uh, delta width is going to zero. So you suppose that you're in this situation and you fix uh, a quantity of interest Q. And you say then for every value V in the Okay, in the pi naught essential range of Q, and for every alpha in the sense of the, the board to the top right, so uh, either a very small number uh, for Prokhorov or, or total variation distance, or a very large number of common moments between the models, There exists a mu alpha that is alpha close to um, mu naught. Um, uh, what do I want to say? I also need the delta. Um, and a delta star bigger than zero, such that for all uh, delta positive but smaller than delta star, the um, posterior value of your quantity of interest given this observation under the perturbed system is what you wanted. This takes a moment to, to, to read the order of quantifiers and the order of quantifiers is important because it means that there is, uh, this, is a, this is a bad situation, but it means that there is potentially a fix, but it's a, it's a greater research project. Um, I'm saying that you, you name a prior, okay? You name your prior distribution, and we look to see, okay, the quantity of interest has this range on the support of the prior distribution. Let's say it's between, you know, it has minimum zero, maximum five. I claim that I can take your prior distribution, and I'm sort of a Maxwellian demon here, or maybe not Maxwell, I'm a Laplacian demon, since Laplace is really base. Um, I, I take your prior and your model, and I now tweak it just a teensy bit, a tiny bit, in terms of total variation or Prohorov distance, or while keeping any finite number of test functions that you demand I leave unperturbed the same but I still have enough freedom to take your prior and model and turn it into a nearby prior and model that has, gives a prediction for the, for the posterior value of whatever I wanted. 
but I must know in advance what the quantity of interest I'm trying to break is. And so th this is bad news in the sense that in these topologies, you, the robustness of the posterior predictions and hence what you would, you know, uh, what recommendations you might make uh, if you're in a sort of a client situation are very fragile. But there is hope in the sense that, for one thing, every time you name a quantity of interest and names of data, I play this, I as the demon play this game and pervert your conclusions your, or pervert your model to just a tiny bit off, but the conclusions are what I wanted them to be rather than what you wanted them to be. But if you then change your quantity of interest or you get more data, I probably have to play this game again. So that there is a, a potentially a, a trade-off there. The one thing that I will say here is also is that this is somehow uh, a, a shattering using. We're, we're making very small perturbations to the to the measure and to the model in these topologies. In other topologies, this problem doesn't happen. And so again, from a numerical analysis paradigm standpoint, one should worry, or no, one should simply be curious. If someone says, okay, I've got this very large complex system um, and I'm using my model and I'm getting this conclusion, I'm getting consistency, you go, yeah, but consistency in which topology? And, and are you really forbidding me from making um, such uh, kind of changes here. If, if they insist that the only admissible changes to a prior or to a model are in very strong topologies that measure relative entropy or so on, then I probably believe them. But if it's um, something where you know, they've basically only specified a few moments and that's really all they know about the, about the system and they can't actually specify arbitrary amounts of information to construct a good model, then one should be very um, skeptical that the posterior conclusions are indeed robust under changing the model. Okay, I see that it's 10 o'clock, so I shall thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot for this Blackboard lecture. So we have uh, time for questions. Probably a very naive question. Uh, do you think there could be stronger topologies than the three you mentioned that could uh, uh, make this CRM fail? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so that's what I was hinting at just in the last minute there, that um, uh, if you... Okay. Well, certainly there are stronger topologies that would forbid this, um, this theorem. Um, the first thing I would try would be something that's sort of an entropy-based topology where um, I, I not a, so in, ter in terms of you know, what perturbations am I allowed to make to the measure, in, in our proof what we use are essentially small point mass perturbations, okay, which is kind of a little extreme. Um, you can relax that then to be sort of small localized approximate Dirac's if you wanted. But these uh, such, such measures have quite large relative entropy, very large relative entropy. So the first thing I would try is, um, well, I, we have tried and it doesn't quite work, uh, just, re just demanding that the, the two models be close in a relative entropy distance isn't quite enough to, to forbid this. But I wouldn't rule out the possibility that there is some entropy-like topology that is strong enough to say that any two measures that are this close must have posterior values uh, close to one another. But to be honest, I think that the way to uh, proceed is to simply ask the, this robustness question in advance of seeing the data. I, I, that's a, it's a bigger computational challenge, but I think the way to proceed is that you say, or your client says, we are going to see 10 IID samples of Y. We don't know the distribution yet. We're not going to specify a model. You, the statistician, or you, the probabilist, now construct for us a machine that will give the, the, the sort of the soup and the inf, the, the, the range of, pr worst possible range of predictions, but no worse, 
given that we tell you we're going to see 10 samples, but we're not telling you the model. We're not giving you the model for you to try and break it. You have to design sort of a most pessimistic prediction, knowing the type of data you'll see, but not the values. Whereas it, it's not clear from the way I've written this, I admit, but I also have access to the data. So I can choose which data points I will believe or not believe in this process of perverting your conclusions to become my conclusions. So holding something in the envelope is probably a more, um, having a sealed envelope with the data in it is probably a better way of constructing procedures that are robust than worrying about coming up with a better topology. That, that's, my thing. that's my guess. Okay, I think we need to postpone the other questions and uh, we thank Tim once again.